So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome uh, to our webinar with the eminent doctor, no, professor, sorry, uh, Dick White. I'm Karen Fab murray and I'm the Sales and Marketing Manager for Visio Care Services, and I've got the great pleasure of moderating this evening. So, before I officially introduce you to Dick, just to say this is the second of a series that Dick started one a month ago uh, about the same things, e chronic conditions in dogs. And that is actually available on YouTube. So if anybody wants to go back and have a look at that, just uh, let us know and we can send you the link for that. And I'd really like to thank the Veterinary Edge who've been working in partnership with us to help promote this fantastic webinar series. And we've got a whole host of webinars coming up. So I'll hand over to Dick in a sh short few minutes, just a couple of bits and pieces. There's a chat uh, there on the side. Please put any questions in there and we'll come to questions at the end when Dick's finished. What you're going to see as we go through the presentation is Dick using VisioCare Consult, our actual tool, which I'm very proud to say Dick was very uh, hands on in the, in the making of this amazing tool. And I think you're going to be blown away by it. And then at the end, we'll take questions and a couple of other sort of little bits and pieces of admin. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Professor White. Uh, he's the founder of Dick White Referrals, as I think most of you will know. And, and I believe if it's not the biggest, it's one of the biggest in Europe. Is that right, Dick? Biggest, yep. biggest now, yeah. Biggest now, fantastic. He tries and everything, Karen. Pardon me? Size isn't everything. Oh, well, that's possibly true, Dick, but I better not <laughs> say that on my very. Right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, so he graduated from the Royal Veterinary College and then he joined the Cambridge Veterinary School, which is just down the road from actually from, from where I'm based. And he was the clinical oncologist. He's taken a residency in surgery. He's become a senior lecturer in small animal surgery. And I think he was at Cambridge for over 20 years, if I've got my facts right. Is that right, Dick? Okay. Yes. Fabulous. And uh, he was appointed visiting professor at the University of Tennessee. That sounds like a great place to go for a holiday. <laughs> so he founded the Dick White Referral Center, as we said, in 2013. And he's published hundreds of peer reviewed journals. He lectures, lectures regularly, both nationally and internationally. He was just telling me he was doing a lecture for our colleagues in France in French yesterday. So I think it's a bit of light relief for him to talk to <laughs> tonight in English. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Dick. You're in for a fabulous evening. I absolutely know that. So hold on to your seats. Let's get this show on the road, Dick. Lovely. Thank you very much, Karen. Let's uh, just share the screen. So we just make sure we can all see that. And indeed. Super. Can't see you, Karen. I don't know where you are. I should be down in your bottom corner near the Visio Care logo. You should see me. Can you mm. see me now? Can't see me. Uh, anyway, if uh, if we can all see that, that's great. We can. We okay, can. good. Right. Uh, welcome along. Cheers. Um, thank you very much, Karen. And also thank you, Visio Care, for organizing uh the second of these talks this evening it's a great pleasure to be able to reach out to you through these webinars so in the discussion last month we talked about management of chronic ear disease number one was in the dog because uh, at this time of year we were concerned uh, we we're obviously concerned about the increasing number of dogs that we see with ear problems tonight we're going to talk about the cat and uh, as you'll see the cat's completely different and ear disease in the cat isn't really related to uh, seasonal incidents uh, so what will we be talking about we're going to be talking about the anatomy of the cat's ear which is really quite interesting and that has quite a lot of bearing for the pathophysiology of the ear diseases that we see in the cat we're also going to be talking about some surgeries and we'll talk about ventral buller osteotomy, which is a really important procedure in the cat. And we'll also talk about total ear canal ablation, which is we do do it in the cat, but it's much less important and much less significant 
than ventral bullar osteotomy. So hopefully by the end of uh, this evening's discussion, you'll understand uh, all there is to know about the cat's ear anatomy, why they get the diseases that they do, and you'll feel confident to tackle some of the surgeries. So I'm sure you're aware, and we're always being told that cats are different. And nowhere, I think, is that more true when it comes to dealing with diseases of the ear. And cats are different in terms of their anatomy, which we're going to look at in a moment, in terms of the pathophysiology of the diseases they get, and in terms of the surgeries that we do and the outcomes. So it's, uh, it's almost like dealing with a completely different topic when we come to look at chronic diseases in the cat. What we discussed last month and what we learned last month about the dogs here, frankly, doesn't apply at all to the cat. So let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of the cat's ear, which, as we're going to see, is really quite different. And there are differences, first of all, in the external ear. And the cat has much more developed auricular muscles than the dog, or indeed uh, in, in the human. And this means that they're able to rotate the pinna through 180 degrees from directly forwards to directly to the rear. And this is all to do with sound collection. So the pinna, the uh, mobility of the pinna aids their ability to hear things and to pinpoint, particularly to pinpoint sound. So they're rather like uh, rather large radar dishes or radio telescopes. Um, the main difference, however, that will concern us tonight really is in the middle ear. And the tympanic chambers of the cat are really quite different to the dog for some very good physiological reasons. Now, last, last month when we talked about the dog, we talked about the middle ear, and we identified these uh, three chambers, uh, sorry, three parts of the chambers, the epitympanic, which is this bit up here with the ossicles, the mesotympanic chamber or the true tympanic chamber, <clears throat> which has got the tympanic membranes, and the hypotympanic chamber down here. But one has to say that largely these three components are pretty much all part of the same chamber. So we consider them together. And you know, if you remember, we looked uh, at the uh, ear of the dog. There is this slight separation between the ventral chamber here, the hypertympanic chamber, and the mesotympanic chamber, and a bony shelf separating, uh, showing some separation. Now, in some dogs, that bony shelf is really very well developed. Um, but generally, the whole tympanic chamber functions as a single entity. Now, this is where the big difference is with the cat. The cat indeed has the same epitympanic, mesotympanic, and hypertympanic chambers, but they are very much separated. So we have the epitympanic and the mesotympanic chamber here, and then separating the two is this bony shelf from the hypertympanic chamber. So up here, we can see the true tympanic chamber, the mesotympanic chamber with the epitympanic structures. There's then a bony shelf here and this very large ventral hypotympanic chamber. Now, the two do communicate on this medial surface here. There's a little communicating fissure, um, but there's a great deal more separation between the mesotympanic and the hypertympanic chamber. And the hypertympanic chamber in the cat is relatively much larger in, indeed. Um, so if we look at the chambers in the cat, we can see this very large ventral chamber here, the true tympanic chamber uh, with the epitympanic recess, this bony shelf with the little communicating fissure, and then this very large 
hypotympanic chamber here. And that, of course, uh, explains the radiographic appearance of the tympanic chamber in the cat. In the cat, plain radiography is very, very helpful uh, in determining middle ear changes, whereas in the dog, it's really not that helpful at all. But the most striking characteristic radiographically is that we see this double profile. Here's the ventral part of the mesotympanic chamber. Here's the ventral part of the hypotympanic chamber, which equates to these two bony structures here. So the question then is why do felidae and all felidae, it doesn't matter whether it's your domestic short hair or lion or a jaguar or whatever, why do felidae have this different middle ear anatomy? And the answer is because their hearing is much more sensitive and much more specific. Cats can hear at one and a half octaves above the human range and an octave, a full octave above the canine range. They can hear noises four to five times further than humans. And most importantly, they're able to pinpoint sounds very, very accurately. So this whole structure together with the external ear change, external ear variation rather, is to do with hunting and finding prey. And even the domestic cat is much closer, closely, more closely related to the original wildcat than the dog is uh, today. So those are some of the anatomic differences and it's not surprising therefore that we see some pathophysiological differences when we look at the diseases that affect the feline ear. And these are probably the main diseases that we see. We see middle ear polyps, we see tumors that develop in the external ear and then infections and paraaural abscesses which develop in the middle ear chamber. But easily by far the most important, by a really long way I think, is this disease, the middle ear polyp that we see here. And really cumulatively they overshadow I think all of the other diseases that we see in the cat with the possible exception of acute problems such as parasitic diseases. So let's focus a little bit on what middle ear inflammatory polyps or MEIPs are. It's a condition that's specific to the felidae. Now that's not to say it hasn't been recorded in other species and it certainly has been recorded in humans and in the dog but the point is those cases have been recorded because they're so unusual. Uh, it's a condition then that's uh, far more associated with cats than any other species. And it is, I think, the most important chronic cat ear disease by far, leaving aside the acute conditions and uh, parasitic conditions and so on. When we come to look at chronic problems in the cat's ear, I think really the first thing to start thinking about is, does it have a polyp or not? And let's rule in polyp, rule in or rule out polyp first of all. So what is a polyp? Well, it's a mass of chronic inflammatory tissue that derives from the epithelial lining of either the tympanic chamber or the eustachian tube. And I think you know, even now we're not really clear whether it happens primarily in the tympanic chamber or in the eustachian tube, but certainly both are possible. Um, and it may be that uh, it's not really specific to either or the other because both are lined with a secretory epithelium. What's the etiology of them? Well, we see this problem mostly in young cats. And certainly we see cats much later in life with middle ear polyps. But if you actually delve into their history, we usually find that the problem dates back to when they were usually in the first year of life. And that usually follows an upper respiratory tract infection episode. So typically these cats will have an episode of flu, cat flu or whatever we want to term it generally, and then start to show symptoms probably one, two, three months later on. But certainly we do see many older cats uh, with polyps, 
if you investigate them, almost certainly it goes back to the first 12 months of their life. Now, in some of these polyps, uh, people have recovered upper respiratory virus. And I think generally we accept that it's not really the virus itself which causes the, the polyp. What happens, we think, is that there is a eustachian obstruction. So here's our eustachian tube and the upper respiratory viral infection causes swelling and edema and possibly some scarring in the eustachian tube, which prevents the failure or rather results in the failure of normal drainage. Now, remember last month we talked in the dog that the middle ear has a secretory epithelium, which is producing mucus. It collects cellular debris and then it's swept into the eustachian tube where the cilia moves it down into the nasopharynx. What seems to be the case in the cat is that if that becomes obstructed, this drainage becomes obstructed, then we get chronic epithelial inflammation and particularly in the mesotympanic chamber. And uh, this, uh, I, I think our awareness of this came uh, accidentally through a group of researchers who are trying to recreate a model, an animal model for glue ear in children. And unfortunately, they began with cats, with experimental cats, and they ligated the eustachian tube in an effort to recreate glue ear. And in fact, of course, they didn't get glue ear. What they got was a whole bunch of cats with polyps. So the suggestion is that failure of eustachian drainage causes chronic inflammation of the tympanic epithelium, and it starts to produce these polyps. So where do we find polyps? We find them, of course, in the tympanic chamber itself. Uh, and most, we think, start in the mesotympanic chamber, and they can extend into the uh, hypotympanic chamber. So um, many of them, most of them indeed, are confined to the tympanic chambers, primarily to the mesotympanic chamber, and they can then climb through the fissure down into the hypotympanic chamber down here. Okay, so that's the first and most important site. Now, of course, they can extend down the eustachian tube. So they can move from the mesotympanic chamber down the eustachian tube into the nasopharynx. And that, of course, is how we see nasopharyngeal polyps like this. So they arrive on a very uh, slender stalk from the eustachian tube and then proliferate in the nasopharynx to produce these um, rather meaty lumps in the back of the uh, pharynx. The third option is that the polyp, instead of moving into the eustachian region, can progress through the tympanic membrane, through the major tympanic membrane, into the external meatus. And that results in polyps in the external ear. Now, let me just stress that the polyp that we see here, I've used as a good example because it's easy to see. But most of the time when cats have polyps, you won't see this. But if you do otoscopy and look all the way down to where the tympanic membrane should be, what you'll see is a little fleshy pea structure just peeping out through the tympanic membrane. And that's why it's so important if you have a cat with otorrhea to really look all the way down to the tympanic membrane. So what are the clinical symptoms? Now, this, I think, is the, probably the most interesting part of middle ear inflammatory polyps because cats present with such a wide array of symptoms, many of which don't seem to be related at all to a disease in the middle ear. So first of all, uh, for polyps that develop and remain in the tympanic chamber, the vast majority of cats remain asymptomatic. And, you know, as I said earlier on, you often get uh, an older cat, maybe 10 years of age, which you radiograph the skull for some reason, and lo and behold, there's a density in the tympanic chamber. So this cat would have had a middle ear polyp for most of its life. And I'm sure that there are thousands, indeed tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of cats out there that have got middle ear polyps who never show any real symptomatology. 
Now, for those polyps that remain in the tympanic chamber and don't go down the eustachian tube or through the tympanic membrane, they can give rise to significant intratympanic pressure. And that produces a vestibular syndrome because of the pressure on the inner ear. So we see cats that look like this. And these, this symptomatology can be really quite long standing. This cat had had a head tilt vestibular signs for 18 months. This cat, I think I'm right in saying, presented to us with a five year history of vestibular syndrome. The prognosis for them incidentally is excellent, really very good if you fix the problem. But I think the message is that if you see a cat with a head tilt, I think your primary diagnosis should be a middle ear polyp until you disprove that and find something else. And in the clinic here, we have an arrangement with the neurology group that any cat with a head tilt goes to the soft tissue surgeons, the head and neck surgeons, before it goes to the neurologist because 95% of the time, it's a middle ear polyp. Now, what about these polyps that develop in the nasopharynx behind the soft palate? What they lead to, and they can become really quite large, they cause post nasal obstruction. And so the symptoms we see, first of all, is stertor. So these are cats that mouth breathe and they make a noise, I hope I can do it, which is. <laughs> They don't nasal breathe at all. There's no air movement through the nasal sinuses. So the first sign is they have stertor. The second is usually the drainage from the nasal sinuses becomes secondary infected. So they get what's usually a bilateral mucoporolin discharge like this. Um, and then on top of that, because this mass is physically so large, they find it difficult to eat. Now, um, when I first discovered years and years ago about middle ear inflammatory polyps, I was horrified because I knew that I'd seen dozens and dozens and dozens of cats that had had a recent episode of cat flu that had had, that had been dysphagic, that had purulent discharge, that had noisy breathing, and we simply diagnosed it as post-viral uh, rhinitis. Uh, Post-viral rhinitis I don't think even exists in the cat. If you see a cat after respiratory viral infection with these symptoms, it has a polyp. Now the other interesting presentation is the mass in the external ear. And again, let me stress that you're unlikely to see this bit, the actual mass. What you're very likely to see is the outer ear the messy discharge, and this is usually unilateral. So again, if you see a young cat that has got a unilateral otorrhea, then do please have a look at the uh, tympanic membrane and see if you can find evidence of a, of a polyp down there. So here's the important point, I think, in terms of symptomatology. The next time that you see a young cat, particularly after an episode of flu, with any or some of the following signs, which is stertor or dysphagia or nasopharyngeal mass or nasal discharge, vestibular syndrome, external meatal mass, otorrhea. If you see any of those symptoms, either individually or as a combination, then please think about polyp because 99% of the time you'll be right. Polyps are very common. How do we confirm the diagnosis? Well, for the external meatal uh, masses, again, you're not likely to see this, but do an otoscopy and you'll see this like P-like granulation, uh, sorry, chronic granulation tissue in the position of the tympanic membrane. And that's fairly straightforward. For the cats that have got nasopharyngeal polyps, this is a bit trickier and making this examination in the conscious cat is pretty tricky. Um, what you need to do is to get a spatula or your biro, and you'll get one opportunity to do this as the cat opens its mouth, is just to poke the spatula into the soft palate there. Cats won't tolerate that a second time, so do make sure you get it right. 
What you will normally feel is the soft palate deform into the nasopharynx. If it doesn't deform, there's a mass behind there. Now, imaging is really very, very helpful. And as we mentioned earlier on, plain radiography is very, very sensitive indeed in the cat. Certainly not in the dog. And we don't really rely on uh, plain radiography in the dog to investigate middle ear disease. So what we're looking at here is a cat with a normal ear with the radiolucency in the hypertympanic chamber. And here we can see soft tissue density. Could be fluid, could be granulation tissue. So a simple radiograph like that will tell you yes or no. The other changes you may see radiographically are in chronic cases, you may see bony thickening and irregularity like that. And the other thing you should be on the lookout for is a soft tissue mass in the nasopharynx there, which tells us that there's a nasopharyngeal mass. But radiography is really very straightforward, very, very useful, and uh, uh, very reliable in the cat, not in the dog, of course. Now, uh, we have increasing access to sectional imaging, and particularly with MR, we can see this soft tissue mass there. But the question I think has to be asked, you know, a, a, a radiograph is going to be con considerably less expensive than an MRI study. What's the additional information that you're going to get? Because, you know, all that tells us initially is that there's a polyp there, and we already knew that from the plain radiography. Well, the answer is this, that uh, potentially it highlights any inner ear or brain changes. So particularly if you have a cat with neurological signs, then an MR is useful. Now, if we look at this soft tissue mass here, we can see that there are changes in the brain here. And this cat had a head tilt, and unsurprisingly, we see changes in the brain there. So there are some benefits, I think, to doing MR, but it's perfectly possible to go ahead and treat without that. Now, in terms of treatment, broadly, we've got two options, although fundamentally, they come back down to the same thing. We're trying to remove the polyp from the middle ear. And in theory, we have two options. One is traction, the other is ventral buller osteotomy. Now, traction we can do if we've got a mass in the external ear, and here's a cat where we've removed the polyp just simply by traction. You'll often get a little bit of bleeding, but that's easy to stop. So that's pretty straightforward. But do remember that what you've removed is the polyp in the external ear. You haven't touched the polyp material in the middle ear. And the same is true for the nasopharyngeal polyps. If you take hold of these with forceps and traction and twist them, you'll be able to snap off the eustachian connection here. You get a little bit of bleeding again, but there we go. So it, it's, it's very reassuring from the immediate effect on the cat because the cat can now breathe and it can eat and it doesn't have nasal discharge. But don't forget that you've left polyp material in the middle ear. Um, for the nasopharyngeal polyps, if you're going to remove them, um, don't get tempted to make an incision into the soft palate here. It's really not necessary. Cat soft palate is pretty flexible. And so if you take a soft palate or a sen retractor like that and really give the cordal, the trailing edge of the soft palate, a good heave, then you'll see be able to get access to the nasopharyngeal polyp, or it may even be bilateral in some cases. Now, some years ago, we were interested in looking at the long-term outcome for traction. And so we treated patients that had had traction with prednisolone for a fairly significant dose for 21 days. And then we looked at the recurrence rate uh, at one year. And what we discovered that was for cats with nasopharyngeal polyps, only around about 10% of them represented with clinical signs after a, over a period of 12 months. On the other hand, the cats with external ear polyps, at least half of them came back with clinical signs. So I think one would say, uh, if you've got a cat with a polyp in the external ear, 
then traction is not the solution. You need to go to ventral bullar osteotomy. For the nasopharyngeal polyps, uh, I think it's worth doing because only 10% will come back. Uh, in my situation, I can't afford to have even 10% come back. So even those would have ventral bullar osteotomy. But if there are financial constraints, then I think for nasopharyngeal polyps, it's worth going down the traction and uh, prednisolone route. So that leads us on neatly to surgery for chronic diseases of the feline ear. And, you know, because the diseases that we see in the feline ear are different because of their anatomy, we do different surgeries. And that's really very much the case here. In the cat, we do lots and lots and lots of ventral bullar osteotomies. Uh, we don't do very many total ear canal ablations. In the dog, we do lots and lots of total ear canal, but we very rarely do ventral bullar osteotomy. What does ventral bullar osteotomy do for the polyp? It reduces the recurrence rate. And that can be, we anticipate that to be reduced to somewhere between, well, certainly less than 5% and probably only 1% or 2%. Cheers. So that's the first thing it does. The second thing it does, which is much more acute, is that it decompresses the tympanic chamber. And therefore, if you've got a cat with neurological signs, ventral bullar osteotomy is the only solution. You should not be trying to do traction and curatage for cats that have got neurological signs. Okay, so let's just summarize the difference between dogs and cats. Cats get primary middle ear disease. It starts in the middle ear, it's polyp disease, and the surgery only needs to address the middle ear. In stark contrast to the dog, dog's middle ear disease is secondary to the external ear disease. Okay? And the surgery that we do, total ear canal ablation, takes care of both the external ear and the middle ear change. Okay? So we very rarely do total, or we uncommonly do total ear canal in the cat for that reason. The other interesting comparison in the cat is that VBO, ventral bullar osteotomy, is a very common procedure because we have lots of cats with polyps and the access to the ventral bullar is very simple. I would happily do ventral bullar osteotomy in cats all day long because I know it's an easy procedure. In the dog, it's an unusual procedure. We tend to do it for things like cholesteatoma and degenerative diseases and it's a much more complex approach. I hate, even after, I don't know how many decades of experience, I hate ventral bullar osteotomy in the dog. Uh, and if I can get somebody else to do it and deal with the complications, so much the better. Now, one tip about VBO, ventral bullar osteotomy, is that the uh, base of the skull here is not flat. So if you put the cat's head flat on the table like that, then the uh, base of the skull is at this kind of angle. So what I would suggest you do is to put a pack underneath the nose and then tape the nose to the table. And what that does is give you a flat operating surface here to get to the tympanic bulla. Okay, it may seem like a small thing to do, but trust me, after you've spent half an hour trying to find the tympanic bulla, you wish you'd done that. But that's a little tip to start. The, I always say to my surgeons, there are th three most important things to remember when you are doing ventral bullar osteotomy is location, location, location. Sounds like an ad for a Channel 4 program. But I, I must say that if you get your incision in the wrong place, it turns into a very unhappy surgery. And getting your incision in the right place uh, knowing where you should be approaching makes life so simple. So here are the landmarks. Here's the cat, obviously, in dorsal recumbency with its upper jaw taped to the table. This finger is on the larynx. Okay, very easy landmark to find, even in fat cats. This finger is on the angle of the jaw. You then draw in a triangle like that and make your incision in the middle of the triangle and I get my surgeon's 
when they're starting to draw that in take a felt tip and draw that on the cat it doesn't matter whether you have an incision this direction or that direction or this direction you will find the ventral bulla now if you don't do that you either end up particularly laterally is where many surgeons end up or rostrally trying to dissect uh, through the base of the tongue so trust me i'm a surgeon find those two landmarks and you'll be a happy surgeon now there are one or two uh, structures to look out for and generally you should not find these if your incision is in the right place here but if you do come laterally you will find the bifurcation of the maxillary and lingua facial vein here okay and if you see that then you are too lateral come medial here okay and likewise the hypoglossal nerve you may see that on the way down usually if you've been too lateral so these are structures that you may see if you're too lateral come medial okay what are we aiming to get towards we're aiming to get to the hypotympanic chamber first of all which is this and notice that it's not circular it looks like a hen's egg and it's obliquely orientated and sometimes it has a ridge a sharp ridge along here so don't expect to find a nice circular structure you'll be very disappointed feel for this oval structure okay this is what we're looking for nice white bone now uh, use two mini gelpies or a sternomastoid retractor you don't have to do a lot of dissection you should not be cutting through muscle let me stress, you should be separating fascial planes. There may be a little periosteum over the tympanic bone. But if you find yourself cutting into vessels and into muscles, you're in the wrong place. OK, so this is what we're looking for. This nice, clean, usually clean, sharp, bony profile. How do you get into there? Well, uh, we show here using a drill and a drill bit and to be honest I don't think that's very good advice I think the best thing to do is to take a K wire or to take the small drill bit and do it by hand okay, remember this is the kind of thing that you're trying to access it's like the shell of an egg and I have seen on a couple of occasions uh, orthopedic surgeons doing ventral buller osteotomy because it you know, it's thought to do something to do with bone using a power drill and I've seen two cases of cats with their skulls transfixed to the foam of the operating table because this is a very very fragile structure and if you put any pressure on it at all it will go straight through the bone straight through the rest of the skull into the foam padding on the operating table be careful because sometimes if the bone looks like this, that will fragment like a piece of dried cheese. It's very, very fragile. It just disintegrates in front of you. So do be very, very careful with this bone. Uh, once you've made an opening, you can use your rongeurs or uh, your neuro rongeurs to uh, remove the bone and try to visualize this eggshell and you're removing bits of the eggshell people ask how much of that eggshell can you remove the answer is the whole lot if you want to it, it will improve your exposure there's no there's no downside to removing lots of that bone in quite a few cases you will aspirate mucus and people i think misinterpret this and get very excited about infections and try to culture it and all that kind of nonsense this is mucus, this is middle ear mucus. And as we mentioned last month, the epithelial lining of the tympanic cavity secretes mucus, which traps cellular debris and is swept away down the eustachian tube. If you obstruct the eustachian tube, the mucus accumulates in the tympanic chamber. That it's as simple as that. It's a mechanical obstruction, it does not mean infection does not mean that you have to ply these cats with all kinds of antibiotics post-operatively. That's all it means. Okay, now we've got into this ventral chamber, the hypertympanic chamber, but actually the polyp will be in here in the mesotympanic chamber 
and we need to get through this bony shelf. And this is a little bit more tricky because we need to go from here to there. This bit's comparatively easy. We can remove all of this bone, but getting through this bony shelf needs a bit of contemplation. Again, you can do it with a K-wire or a drill held in your hand. I think a K-wire is best. Now, here's the, let me just do that again, because obviously this is the uh, anatomy upside down, the cat's upside down. Here's the hypertympanic chamber. Here are the inner ear structures. There's the external ear. Now, the best advice, best possible advice I can give you is to stay as lateral as possible when you come through this bony shelf, which again is like an eggshell. So come there, okay? The mistake that get commonly made is that people make their approach here and look what happens straight into the inner ear, okay? And that's something very much to be avoided. So we get problems and regret if we do that. So stay as lateral as you possibly can and that will give you access that will allow you then to detach the polyp. You'll see the polyp, you'll be able to detach it. Sometimes it looks like this. More often, sorry, it looks like this. You get little fragments out. Uh, use a little um, disc curettage, uh, vertebral, inter, uh, intervertebral disc cu curette to get these fragments out. Try not to be too aggressive because you're certainly going to uh, stir up the autonomic chain. And if you're really unlucky, you may stir up the inner ear. So uh, try to visualize what you're doing. Do a little bit of irrigation aspiration so that you can see what you can see. Now, some of these cats, as we mentioned earlier, will have a mass in the external meatus. So they're going to have a mass here. What are we? Can we do something about that during the ventral bullar osteotomy? Absolutely. We take our little curette and staying as laterally as we can, we pass that curette through where the tympanic membrane used to be and won't be and curette in this region here and then we apply some suction through the external ear chamber and that allows us to remove the, the polyp material okay so don't forget that because there's nothing worse than doing a ventral bullar osteotomy cat wakes up and it's still got a lumping great polyp in its ear something that owners tend to notice now, what about the complications of ventral bullar osteotomy? And I think these have been very much overemphasized. We talked last month about some of the complications of uh, total ear canal in the dog, which have been overemphasized. Certainly, you should be aware of the complications and understand their significance. Horner's syndrome, I would say almost all cats will have this preoperatively. And certainly, if you haven't done ventral bullar osteotomy before, you will expect the first 10 cats to all have Horner's syndrome because what you've done is disturb the autonomic chain in the tympanic chamber as you did the curatage and removed the polyp. So it, it's a given. What's the prognosis? Most of them get better. Okay, Most of them get better within three to four weeks. So if the cat wakes up looking like this, don't panic. Don't call VDS or your, whoever your insurers are. What I would always do when I do a ventral bullar osteotomy to the, uh, to, for a cat is to say to the owners as part of the preoperative information, when the cat comes back to you, its eye will look a bit funny. That will resolve. Okay, now, what about these cats with vestibular syndrome? And first of all, the chronic preoperative cases. This cat was 18 months with a head tilt. The other cat we saw was four or five years? The answer is they will get better. The prognosis for them is fantastically good. Now it may take, you know, the, the cat with, who'd had symptoms for five years took around about five months to resolve, but it did get better. And cats that have had neurological signs for a few weeks or a month or two will usually get better by the time you take the stitches out in, in these patients. So the prognosis is great, and I would always encourage you, if you've got a cat with a vestibular syndrome that you think is a polyp, do the surgery. It will get better. Now, what about patients that wake up with this kind of problem? Okay, they didn't have it preoperatively, 
that they get nystagmus and head tilt. That means that you have disturbed the inner ear during your curatage and these often do not resolve. So the prognosis is different. If you stir up the inner ear during the surgery, it's rather more traumatic than the chronic pressure of having the polyp in the middle ear. So stay away from the rostromedial part of the mesotympanic chamber. Now, quite an interesting thing, when we do total ear canal in the dog, we always talk with owners about whether the dog will be able to hear or not. And very largely, we've ignored this in cats. Um, I think we're so pleased that we've been able to alleviate their neurological symptom or their nasal discharge that we don't think very much about whether the cat can hear. So the answer to the question, will my cat regain normal hearing after VBO surgery? The answer is I'm afraid not. Uh, there's a study out of the States a year or two ago which looked at the brainstem conducted, uh, uh, brainstem evoked potentials for the air conducted hearing. And logically you'd think if you've taken a lump out of the middle ear, there's air in there, it should be able to hear, but apparently not. However, cats will still hear through their bone conducted hearing. So it's unlikely you're gonna have a cat that shows any change to what it was preoperatively. Okay, so let's move on now and quickly deal with the other surgery that we do, which is total ear canal ablation. And once again, the indications for total ear canal in the cat are completely different to the dog. We do it mainly for tumors of the ear, occasionally for abscess. This concept of end stage ear, which we talked about in the dog, we rarely see in the cat. Occasionally we do uh, total ear in cases of some recalcitrant polyps, not many, but occasionally. So the most common indication are tumors of the external ear. These are ceruminous gland tumors, and they may be adenomas, or they may be apparently high-grade high grade adenocarcinomas, even with metastatic disease. The good news is, irrespective of the histology, they have an excellent prognosis. Irrespective of whether high-grade or whether they got lymph node metastasis, they have an excellent prognosis and they will live for years after the surgery if we do a good surgery. Uh, abscesses, sinuses like this, we sometimes see after cat bites, cats that have uh, fought and bitten through the uh, ear canal, we get these paraaural abscesses. The end stage ear, which is so important in the dog, is a rarity in the cat. How many cats have you seen with this kind of, of change there? So if we look at overall, at least half of these will be, we'll be doing for ceruminous gland tumors, some for recalcitrant polyps, some for what I put in inverted commas, end stage. Uh, in other words, chronic uh, degenerative changes, aural hematomas and, and things like that, where we're doing pinectomy as well. Okay, so the technique is fundamentally similar in the cat to the dog. We make an incision, include all the pathological tissue. However, there is a very big but. Don't make the incision too far up the pinna or too wide. The vascular supply to the cat's pinna is really quite uh, fragile. And if you make a whacking great horizontal incision high up on the pinna, what you'll discover is that uh, owners will come back to you four or five days later with a cat that's got necrosis of the pinna. And again, that's something that owners tend to notice and ask why the top of the cat's ear has, has dropped off. So be conservative. It's unlikely that there are going to be extensive pathological changes uh, when you do this in the cat. We talked in the dog about how to avoid facial nerve injury. Um, and I wish I could give you some simple advice to uh, avoid facial nerve injury in the, in the cat. The facial nerve is exquisitely sensitive in the cat. And even if you do not touch it, the disturbance around the annular cartilage here will be enough to cause edema and temporary neuropraxia. So, Again, I think if you're going to do total ear canal, you do need to be warning owners 
their cats will have quite a high incidence, a high likelihood of at least facial neuropraxia and possibly facial paralysis. Okay, when we remove the external meatus from the external osseous prominence, it's much easier to see in the cat, they're much easier to separate, and that's quite straightforward. And the little bit of soft tissue which lines the opening to the osseous prominence here is really quite easy to strip out. In the dog, this is quite a big deal. In the cat, uh, just take a little curette and that will almost fall out really quite easily. Now, my advice, I think, is to stay in the upper mesotympanic chamber. Stay away from the rostrum medial part, as, as we've talked about before, and don't try and get to be too brave and clean out the hypertympanic chamber, because to do that, you've got to do an osteotomy. And if you think that there is disease in the ventral, in the hypertympanic chamber, then do a ventral bull or osteotomy and decide if you need to do totally a canal later on. Do not, in my experience, do not try to do ventral bullar osteotomy through this bony shelf here. That will end in tears. Okay, closure of the dead space is pretty straightforward. Um, again, do not place a drain, uh, particularly for polyps and for tumors. There's no reason to believe that there's any risk of infection in these patients. And my strong view is that trying to place a drain will create more problems than it solves. Now, what about the complications? Well, we see Horner's syndrome because we'll be disturbing the mesotympanic chamber. We see facial nerve paralysis. This is a rather hilarious drawing I found on the web. I haven't seen many cats that actually look like that. And we see vestibular syndrome very, very occasionally. Uh, so facial nerve injury, we said, is very common in the cat and most resolve within weeks. Some don't. If you've really lacerated the facial nerve, the cat will have facial paralysis. It's not the end of the world, but it does have some significance for the cat. Uh, many years ago, um, one of my colleagues looked at the kind of incidents that we were getting with our total ear canal ablations, and at least 50% had some kind of either neuropraxia or paralysis. Uh, and that was particularly true for the tumor patients where you have to do a bigger dissection. Uh, they stood a much greater chance of getting paralysis. The good news is three quarters of them were resolved in three months and even more were resolved at the end of 12 months. So don't be too despondent and offer to give the clients their money back after you've done the surgery if the cat's got facial paralysis. Horner's syndrome, Again, because you're disturbing the tympanic chamber, uh, quite a significant number, four out of 10 will get it. Uh, where you've got polyp patients and we're doing a little curatage, then the incidence is much higher. But again, look at that, most resolve within uh, three months. Okay, so that's been a really pretty quick romp through what happens to cats' ears. I think really very important to polyps I'm sure you can all think about cats that you've seen in the last week or two, which on reflection probably have got polyps, and uh, I would go back and uh, look at them. Thank you very much. I'll give you a virtual right. round of applause. <laughs> that was absolutely amazing. Great. Thank you. If there are any Thank questions, you. I'll... Uh, yeah, answer. I've got a few here that have come up on the oh, screen, good. and I've got a couple sent in to me as well. So Lindsay Hughes is asking, are any sites of the middle ear wall predisposed to the polyp stalk developing or is it random? Um, I, I wish I knew the answer to that. I think the, the, the fact is that the whole of the tympanic chamber, the mesotympanic chamber, and particularly the upper part of the eustachian tube has the kind of epithelium which will respond like that. So, you know, if, if you're looking to uh get a tip in terms of where the polyp will be attached i don't know I, it varies enormously and some undoubtedly do start at the top of the eustachian tube some will be right in the middle of the tympanic chamber but you know good question i wished i wished i knew the answer to that okay uh nikki has asked the question are any breeds predisposed to the meip 
I don't think so. And you know, I have to say, I've seen them across all of the uh, all of the species. Um, I just, I guess, I tend to remember the ones I've seen in Maine Coons, because Maine Coons are such bloody big cats, yeah. and they have huge polyps and so on. Um, the Oriental ones, you know, you do see them, but I'm not sure that they are quite as prone. So I, I think you should uh, suspect polyp in any kind of breed of cat. Okay. There's another question coming from Marla, if I've said that right. MEIP, those with brain MRI changes, increased surgical morbidity risk question, persistence and signs question, recurrence question. So you've got three in one there. Yeah, good, <laughs> good question. Um, the uh, MR that we showed with that uh, cat that got brain changes had had... Uh, neurological signs for four or five months. And we just did a routine ventral bullar osteotomy and the cat signs resolved within a couple of weeks. So it kind of beg begs the question, you know, why do you see such significant changes on the MR in these cats? You know, it looks as though it's much more than just pressure. Uh, but you know, I think the prognosis is universally good for them. You know, wh whatever the severity of their neurological signs, even if there are brain changes, I would just do the VBO first of all and see where you get to. And, you know, if they, you know, I think the vast majority will resolve if they don't go back and do uh, another MRI and refer it to your neuro, neuro colleague. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you. A couple of questions. Uh, here we go. Another one. Is nystagmus in cats a polyp until proved otherwise? I think if you've got a young cat with head tilt or nystagmus, that's where I would start. I, I would disprove polyp. And, you know, I think back over the years when, <laughs> when I was a young, young vet, and uh, these cats used to be diagnosed as something called cerebellar hyperplasia or cerebellar ataxia, which is a condition which I'm sure does exist. However, uh, looking back, I think 90% of the cats that we put to sleep, of the kittens that we put to sleep, and with this diagnosis of a cerebellar ataxia were due to polyp. And um, looking back, I'm horrified that we missed it. So... Uh, I, I think if you've got a young cat or a cat that's been through an episode of respiratory bar, upper respiratory viral infection, rule out the polyp first of all, and then start looking for the other more complicated, less rare, less common stuff. Okay. Another question from Laura. Are you saying that any older cat with chronic rhinitis is likely to have a polyp? <laughs> I think if you've got a, a cat with bilateral nasal discharge, polyp would be the number one thing to rule out. And then you move down the list to, you know, tumor and fungal disease and immunosuppressed cats and so on. Um, but, you know, I, I think age tends to become a distracting feature because they can live with these polyps for many years. And so we think, well, it's a 12-year-old cat, can't possibly be a polyp. That's a young cat. Actually, you know, it's lived with its polyp for however many years, and now it's suddenly got secondarily infected. So mm. rule the polyp out. I think that's the take-home message, isn't that's it? The take -home message. Out. That's out. the message yeah. I've taken anyway. Um, I, I, I think there must be lots of people listening who are going, oh, I saw a cat last week with nasal discharge, saw a cat with otorrhea last week, I'm going to get it back in. Well, another question from Lindsay, a uh, brilliant walkthrough of the VBO surgery. I'm now wondering if I should be brave enough to do this in practice. Is it GP level, though, or only where referral is not an option? OK, I, I would say VBO is GP level. And, you know, last week, last month, rather, we talked about Tika. And if you follow just one or two very basic rules and try not to spend too much time reading the textbook, you can do tikas in dogs without facial paralysis, without bleeding, without complications. DBO in a cat is, for me, a 10 to 15 minute procedure. Now, I'm not suggesting that everybody in practice will do it that quickly, 
But the actual dissection, you know, if you get the position of the cap right, if you get its head fixed, if you use the landmarks, if you keep feeling for the top of the eggshell as you dissect, it's a very easy dissection because you won't go through any muscles or any big blood vessels. If you're going through muscle or big blood vessels, you're in the wrong place. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, get a cadaver and, and do it. You'll be amazed how simple it is to get to the, the ventral bullet. Do it. If you, get in trouble, if you get in trouble, call me. There you go. There you've got a personal hotline now, Lindsay, to yeah. what? What more could you want? Don't know where in the country you are, but uh... Mate, I mean, if you've got a case you, you want to talk about, by all means, drop me, drop me an email, and uh, I'll talk you through it. I'll talk you through the surgery. I've, I've done that once or twice over the last uh, <laughs> during the pandemic. I've talked people through the surgery. It's quite interesting. Oh wow! <laughs> oh bless you. That's very kind. I'm, uh, I'm acutely aware of the time. Uh, I just have one more question. I had a couple that came in, but I thought what was quite an interesting question is, what is your su suggested post-operative care in the cat after surgery? Okay. I, I mean, I think it's not a major procedure for the cat, but they do need some analgesia and we would use opiate for these patients. So they would stay in the hospital with opiate uh, for 24 hours, particularly so that we can assess them neurologically at the end of that time. Antibiotic, I would use perioperative antibiotics. I would not use postoperative antibiotics. Very occasionally you get a polyp that is secondarily infected and you get pus, but that's very unusual. And, you know, as I say, many people mistake this mucus for infection. Mm. Perioperative antibiotics is all you need. Opiate. And then, you know, in terms of analgesia, monitor them in terms of what you think they need over the next two or three days. But it's not a huge painful surgery for them. OK, that's that's fantastic. Well, uh, thank you all very much for your questions. The great news, yeah. you can, even if you couldn't watch it all, because some of you came in a bit later and we're appreciative of you coming, uh, it's going to be available. You'll be um, able, w w this will be uploaded and you'll be able to, we'll send you an email and you'll be able to download it in a few hours. Douglas says, excellent, really interesting talk. Thank you. I've had lots of great, thank you very much. So, I think everybody's had uh, a very interesting evening. I promised you an interesting evening, having heard uh, Professor White a month ago. So uh, we're going to persuade him to come back and do some more talks for us, I think. But um, yeah, phenomenal. A lot of the um, graphical moving images you saw were through VisioCare Consult. And uh, we have a little special offer for you. So uh, that's in the offers tab there. But please download that and if you book a demo with us really quick 45 minutes and we can show you how it's so brilliant for your practice and we can give you a bit of a baker's dozen we're calling it the veterinary dozen so find out more by having a look at that but we'll pop you an email and uh just written nice graphics prof so uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thank think you, you know thank Jeff, you. don't you thank, you thank you for the nice comments good and uh Craig, thanks, Dick. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Well, I Good. think we should uh, let Prof go away, yes. finish his wine or water or whatever he's drinking there tonight. I no, think last time it, it is it's wine, <laughs> is it? Okay, what are you drinking tonight, Dick? You have to educate this, us again. This is again a, a German Sauvignon Blanc, Ooh, which, I, wow. which I can very much recommend. I, I was very much against Brexit because it makes it so much harder to get German wines. So I guess, um, the price is up for you as well, Dick. The price is double. The price is double. Yeah. I think what we'll do I, I is we'll have, um, we'll have Dick giving us a, a wine tasting one night. Uh, he, seems quite, uh, he seems quite up on his wines. I'd be up yeah. for that anyway. So, I'll sign up. <laughs> me too. Me too. So uh, thank you all so okay. much. It's been a nice fabulous year. evening, and yeah. uh, thank you again. It's been wonderful, and uh, yeah. we'll be in touch soon, Dick. Thank you so Good. much, everybody. Bye -bye. Have a wonderful Bye -bye. evening, and uh, go and enjoy the rest of your evening, and thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you again. Oh, yes, quickly. Our next seminar is next Wednesday night, and it's with Brian Falconer on quite a different topic. It's about very well-being and practice, so very I good. think that will be really interesting. Yeah. So. Good. So, yeah, perfect. We'll see you all hopefully next week. Sign up. Have a Bye. great evening. Bye, Bye. everybody.